Well, good morning, everyone. I would ask that you, if you bring your Bible, uh, if you brought it, to take it and turn to Psalm chapter 20. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Telman family, for bringing those uh, favorite Bible verses. Um, we can remember John. Uh, he is actually a pastor in limbo right now, <laughs> along with the rest of this world. He's uh, looking for a pastoral position in, in wherever God would lead, so he's in a period of rest and also seeking. So we, we pray for you, John. So Psalm chapter 20 is where we are, and I'm going to read the whole psalm. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. Selah. May he give you the desire of your heart and make your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know the Lord saves his anointed. He answers from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O oh Lord, save the king. Answer us when we call. Let's pray before we come to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for the privilege it is to pastor this church, for the things in which you are doing and accomplishing Thank you again, Lord, that you do things when the world shuts down, your work continues to move forward. And you say in your word that before your return, the gospel will be proclaimed to every creature around the globe. And so, Lord, we're grateful that regardless of what's happening around us, you are still at work. And so, Lord, even now I pray as we come to your word, Lord, our hearts can become so hard and I pray right now that you would superintend our hearts and soften them so that we can receive what you have for us. Oh, Lord, make us receptive, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, we are in Psalm chapter 20, and Psalm chapter 20 begins, the very first verse, talking about distress. When I think of distress, I think of a family whose child just got diagnosed with a critical illness. That would be distress. Distress, I've seen it. Maybe you've seen it. We saw it when a foster child got dropped off at our house. Going to a family they know not who, now living in a place they know not where, and you see distress. A spouse that's been unfaithful to their vow. That's distress. Not being able to return home. That's distress. Now I'm not discounting any one of those distressful situations. But what this psalm is speaking to here is not necessarily those types of distresses. I want to bring you to Israel, 2010. That will speak closer to the type of distress to which we are speaking in Psalm chapter 20. You see, what happened is in 2010, I came here to be the pastor of this church. But before coming here, we were in the process of selling our house in a different city, and 
I came to Israel just before arriving here. And it was in Israel, half a world away from where we were living, that my wife gave that all distressful phone call. Do you see what happened is in order for us to buy our home here, in order for me to lead this church to which God was calling us, we had to sell our own old house first. The purchase of the house here was upon, critically, upon the sale of our original house. And it was in Israel that I received that distressing phone call. You see, everything had been lined up, everything was ready, we had a buyer, and then my wife gave me those words. They're not buying it anymore. I'm supposed to be a leader, coming here to minister and to lead this congregation, and now I can't be here and I can't lead. We can't move. See, what this psalm is referring to is what happens when you have a leader who's in distress. What are you supposed to do when your leader is in distress? I'll tell you, as a leader, when things go wrong, your mind jumps into hyperdrive. And you're thinking about all the options. And you're thinking, what should happen and what do you do? Because as a leader, you know how critical things are. You know, sometimes I get distressed just thinking about being a leader in distress. It's that bad. Somebody has said, it is lonely at the top. When you're a leader, you're alone. King David was a leader in distress. In this case, there was an army. The battle lines were drawn, and they had chariots. They had war horses. Back then, for an army to have chariots and and horses was similar to bringing a tank to a battle today. Every additional war horse, every additional chariot was an additional reason why David was in distress. Those war horses, those chariots, gave them the edge in any battle. And so, of course, David considered his plans. He's a leader. He thinks about these things. His mind is jumping into hyperdrive, and he's saying, you slingshot people, you stand up there on that hill, get a good look out. You archers, you go in the back behind the foot soldiers. You foot soldiers, you go in the front. He's planning the battle, but then he looks at all those horses He already tried sending out messengers. The offers of peace have been rejected. You see, he's a leader in distress. For a lot of the things that cause us distress, if we fail in our initiatives, it might affect us. If we have financial distress, it might affect our family. But it's not going to affect the entire nation. For David, if he fails this battle, it will affect everyone. David is in distress. And now what are you supposed to do when your leader is in distress? And you might think that you have nothing to offer. That the best that you can do is follow the orders he gives But if that's all you think, that you have such a limited amount to offer your leader in distress, you are sorely wrong because you have an all-important role that you must fulfill when your leader is in distress. It is incredibly important, and it will cost you no money. 
It will only cost you time and your heart. See, David, on his way to the battle, stops by the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a place where God designated people to worship and pray. And David stops at this tabernacle, and he prays. And this is where you get to take up your role, your all-important role, of what you must do when your leader is in distress. See, David stops by the temple to worship God. He stops by before the battle to pray, and you need to pray for your leader. If you look in Psalm chapter 20, verse 1, it says, May the Lord answer you when you're in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And the people are watching David pray. And they're saying, David, we're praying for you. We're praying that God would answer your prayers, that God would protect you. And he, the verse following says, May God offer you his support from the sanctuary. May he give you support from Zion. The sanctuary was the place where God's presence dwelled. His concentrated presence. The place where God said, This is the place I want to be worshipped. And the people are praying for their leader praying for his success, asking that God from his most concentrated presence would answer David's prayer and that David would know the answer is coming directly from God. David, we have prayed for you that God himself would come in his presence and help you on the battlefield. And when David came to the tabernacle to pray, he brought sacrifices. This was not some sort of deal that he's making with God. It was not some sort of transaction. I give you a sacrifice, you give me a victory. It wasn't a transactional type of relationship. God is a being, he's not a bank. Saul, the previous king of Israel, treated God like he was a bank. And so he says, I have to do these sacrifices. And it cost him his kingdom. See, David, on the other hand, when he's coming to give these sacrifices, he is doing it not in order to ensure God's answer. I give you a sacrifice, you give me a victory. He's coming because he loves God and he worships God and he wants God's blessing. And he wants to submit himself to God. He's coming to God saying, Lord, I'm your servant. I'm serving you. I'm coming to you on the eve of battle, and I need your help. See, that's what David was doing. He's coming to God in worship and prayer, and the people are watching it, and they're praying for their leader. And they say in Psalm chapter 20, verse 3, as they're seeing David worship God, submitting to him, they say, may God remember all your sacrifices, and may he accept your burnt offerings. David, we're praying for you. And when it comes time for God to answer your prayer, may God remember your service. May God remember your worship. May God remember your submission. David, we're praying for you. And you might think that this isn't that important that you pray for your leader. It doesn't seem like praying for your leaders is necessary, especially in someone like David's case. I mean, think about it. This is David. David is an incredible warrior. 
He was so mighty. He was so victorious in so many battles. The Israelites were singing songs about him. His very first battle with Goliath was so victorious. His status as a warrior was unmet. In fact, he was such a great warrior, he went too far sometimes. The reason God would not permit David to build the temple, which was a permanent place. See, right now he's worshiping at the tabernacle, which is temporary. But David wanted to build a permanent place of worship. And God would not let him. He says, David, you're a man of blood. You're too good at what you do, David. You have went too far. On the battlefield, you are such a great warrior, I don't want to be associated with you in building a place of worship for me. And so it was Solomon, his son, who built the temple. Even God himself recognized David's capacity as a great warrior, and so all of us are sort of thinking now, why bother praying for your leader. There was a pastor who came to a church and he says it was the first time I had ever preached at a church where I knew right away we were under a spiritual battle. He says I preached in churches before, but I'll tell you, never in a church like this. Where he says preaching a sermon in that church was as if you were walking through mud with snowshoes on. It was just tough going. And so he says, I organized the people, and we started to pray. He says, once we started praying for our services, once we started praying for our times of worship, that the God that we serve would have freedom to speak, he says, it was preaching was a breeze. If you... Turn back the clock, and when Billy Graham was doing his evangelistic work, they often did things called tent meetings where there was a massive amount of people gathered, and they would be proclaiming about who Jesus was and how he died on the cross for us. And they would do that in a really big tent, just hundreds and hundreds of people in this massive tent. And the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association realized very quickly it wasn't working. And so if you were perceptive, you would have noticed they had set up beside this really, really big tent where they would be telling people about Christ. They set up a smaller tent. And they made a rule. Nothing happens in the big tent until something's happening in the small tent. Because in the small tent, they were praying. See, they understood. The battle is not only physical. It's a spiritual battle. And so in Psalm chapter 20, verse 4, the people pray for their leader. And they're saying, may God give you the desire of your heart. May all your plans succeed. And they're saying, David, we recognize this is not only physical. Yes, you have your battle plans. That's what it's referring to when it says, may your plans succeed. May your plans for the battle succeed. However, David, we're praying about this. You are an incredible, extravagant warrior. But this is not just physical. There is a spiritual component, and the victory ultimately comes from God. And your, vict- your military tactics and everything you do, all of your plans will mean absolutely nothing if God is against you. See, the people understood the battle was not only physical. And so they said, David, We're praying for you. 
that God would bless your military plans. And they said that when God blesses your plans, we're going to come back here and we're going to hold a party. They said we're going to raise a banner, which is like, you know what we do at a parade. We raise a big sign. And we're going to praise God's name because we recognize the victory comes from God. And the victory came because we're praying for you. We're praying for a leader. And so we're giving God the glory for your victory, David, not you. You see, we have to be careful that we don't think of God like a bank. And we don't enter a relationship with him on a transactional basis. On the other hand, there is a transaction that does take place. When you take up your charge to do your all-important task of praying for your leader, there actually is an unexplainable but very visible transaction I mentioned it in this church before. I have an 80-year-old lady from my previous church, and she prays for me every day. Remember? That's how she says it. Every time I phone her, she says, I'm praying for you every day. You know, sometimes I just give her a call. I want to catch up with her. I love this lady. I want to give her a call. How's it going? How's it going with your husband? How's it going with your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids? She wants to know how things are going in our family. But sometimes, I just give her a call because I just want to hear those words. I'm praying for you every day. Because as a leader, you look at what you're doing, and you look at what must be accomplished, and you're looking at these insurmountable odds, and you know the odds are against you. You know, David looked at his insurmountable odds, and he says, they got tanks. And we got slingshots. You know, today, as a leader, we know one false word, one misstep can cause such a great offense in people that they've written you off as a leader for the rest of their life. You just look at what's happening in the political climate. People are voted in one month, the next month, the polls are against them. I remember talking to one leader where he said, someone from their church came up to them and says, you know, Pastor, you're, you know we're behind you, right? And he says, actually, I didn't. You never know. People flip back and forth so much like a teeter-totter. And it even happened with Jesus. He had 12 disciples. He invested in all of them equally. He showed them his miracles. He proved who he was. And then on the night before he went to the cross, he was betrayed. David himself was betrayed as a leader. One time it was his son. One time it was a fellow Israelite from a different tribe. All the way throughout his leadership, people were trying to dethrone him. And in an instant, leaders know that you can be turned on. But when someone says, I prayed for you. And when you have an 80-year-old lady who says, I pray for you every day, there's a transaction that takes place. You see, 
The support of those who pray for their leaders reinvigorates the leader's own faith in God. Every time I phone her, she reinvigorates my own faith in God. And I look at the things we're trying to accomplish, and I look at the things that we're trying to do and the insurmountable odds against us, and sometimes as a leader, you're so aware of the details, and you're wondering if this is going to work out, and you're thinking completely at a human level, but it's when that one person says, I'm praying for you, and we're behind you. That all of a sudden, your own faith in God is reinvigorated, and they say, I am praying for you and your success. You know, folks, as a leader, you begin to listen very carefully to people. And when someone says, I'm praying for the church, I'm praying for the church, I'm praying for the church, and they never say, I'm praying for you, pastor, you're pretty much guaranteed they're saying, pastor, I'm praying for your demise. I want this church to go forward, but I want you to fail. But when they say, I'm praying for your success, your own faith in God is reinvigorated. Because now you're starting to think about what God can do. And you're saying to yourself, I'm serving a God, He doesn't abandon me. I'm serving a God with all the resources of heaven. I'm serving a God who's in complete control. He's almighty. He's all glorious. He's already shown his great love for me at the cross. I'm serving him. And just before the battle, as people were praying for their leader, David's own faith becomes reinvigorated. And look how he responds in verses 6, 7, and 8. Now I know the Lord's saves his anointed. You can hear it. His, his faith is being reinvigorated. He answers him from holy heaven, his holy heaven, with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They're brought to our, their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. He's going into the battle with slingshots against tanks, and he says, well, we got this. We got this. And if you are reading this in the original Hebrew, you'll realize this is spoken of in the past tense. He's speaking before the battle happens, but as if the battle's already occurred. And he's saying, we got this. God's already decided the outcome of the battle and it's in our favor. And we can come with a twig against a tank and we still got it. Because we serve an almighty God. His faith was so reinvigorated, he knew that God already decided the outcome. And it was all because his people took up their all-important role of praying for their leader and his success. And if you look in Psalm chapter 20, verse 1, the people are praying for David, saying, David, may God grant your request. Look now at Psalm chapter 20, verse 9. They're praying and saying, God, answer our prayer. See the difference there? May God answer your prayer, David. And now they're saying in verse 9, may God answer our prayer. And they're saying, David, we're behind you. Your prayer is our prayer. We're seeking God with you. You know, folks, sometimes the most important thing we can do is tell our leader, we're praying for you. We're praying for your success. I'm so blessed that over the years, People have said that to me. Pastor, we're praying for you. What would happen if we went to town office in our town and found our mayor and said, Mayor, we're praying for you. 
that we would talk to our premier and say, premier, we're praying for your success. You would see leaders thinking about God and you'd see a faith in God slowly be reinvigorated. Folks, you have an all-important role. You don't realize how important it is when you pray for your leader. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in which we've been able to spend in your word. And certainly you have challenged us, but you've also blessed us. You've blessed us to know that you have given all of us, regardless of what position you've given, an all-important role. And so, Lord, thank you that you have just elevated all of our positions. That whenever we come to you and pray for that leader's success, you're using us. And you're even using us in the life of the leader. Oh, Lord, help us to be people of prayer. Help us to constantly bring our leaders to you. And help us, Lord, to constantly marvel that the God of the universe is listening to our prayers. Lord, we give ourselves to you, thanking you again that you've elevated all of our own roles, even this day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To close off our time right now, I'm just going to ask that we stand and let's hear God's word. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.